see your video at all, but I ain't worried about that as long as you can see me. Yeah, we can see you good. Hello. Welcome. Welcome back to the Conscious Resistance Live. This is Derek Bros. Thank you guys for tuning in. You just heard the Freedom Movement. Which song is that? Mother Earth? I think so. Check those guys out. Um, it's actually two people. Alais Gray, I think is her name. And the other guy's name, I can't remember. But they both contacted me. Um, they're not originally from Miami, but now they're working out of Miami. And they do a lot of good work spreading awareness through music, which is very important. I'm back with my guest, John Good Vibes of Alchemy of the Modern Renaissance and Good Vibes Promotion. Welcome back, brother. Thanks for having me, man. For sure. I wanted to continue with what you just touched on, which was we were discussing the drug war and how that affects people and moves people to a place of action and how that led you to becoming a more open anarchist. Um, let's, let's get into that. First of all, what does anarchy mean to you? Um, it just means basically the abolition of authority, uh, put very simply. Okay, and so you, I, I know already that you identify as a voluntarist, and most of this audience here is, is aware of what that means, but put voluntarism into your own words. Uh, it's basically the idea that all human interactions should be chosen, so, um, uh, it, it, we have this situation set up uh, under the so-called social contract where we are apparently in a contractual agreement with a group who calls themselves government, who basically thinks that they have the right to tell us what to do and how to live, and I believe that we should have the ability to opt out of things like that. And if we don't have the ability to opt out of things like that, then we aren't free. Uh, and, yeah, that is, that is put simply. And voluntarism is a market-based approach to uh, anarchism as opposed to the, uh, I guess, uh, communistic uh, types of, of anarchy that were, I guess, championed uh, by the early union movements about 100 years ago, even though they were a lot more radical and down than uh, your current uh you know, and comms, I would say. But I definitely wanted to make the point uh, about what we were talking about earlier, about understanding among people with different ideas. Um, as I have to my community over the past few months, I have been approached by a number of communists and socialists who have said, hey, dude, like, I completely disagree with you on economics, but I think your work is great. You have made me think in a different way, and uh, even though I don't agree with you, it, um, it, you, you've shown me a different perspective, and I appreciate that. And um, it has been really some cool conversations that I've been able to have with people who have somewhat different perspectives on economics, but in reality just want the same end result. But at the end of the day, I'm still extremely confirmed at convictions about, uh, you know, free markets and uh, uh, lack of authority. Yeah, definitely. Free markets and lack of authority, I guess, are some definitely some important elements of what it means to be a voluntarist. And as we've, we've kind of always been on the same page as this, that it's important to reach out to others, and especially because, as I've told you before, I come from a place of working with the left anarchists in my community, you know, the Houston Freethinkers, wouldn't be existing, at least in the form it is now, without the encouragement of some of the left anarchists who we also disagree with in the community. But there is a lot of common ground, and um, for me, I see a lot of common ground between uh, mutualism and agorism. What are your thoughts on, on that? I do as well, and I have gotten kind of interested in mutualism because uh, I'm not necessarily sold on anything. Uh, but about six months ago is when I started seeing the word pop up uh, in my research. I had seen it a little bit prior, but in the past six months I've been seeing it pop up a lot. And as I understand it, there are some, basically there, there are key difference 
is about occupancy and use of uh, tangible property like land and things like that. And I think it's an important angle to discuss, but I feel that also there is a slippery slope that kind of begins when you start talking about when somebody has the right to infringe upon somebody else's property. And I feel that that can be pushed by people who want to take advantage of it. So in that sense, I'm a little bit wary of um, that uh, occupancy uh, debate, but I think it's a very important de debate to have. And it's really something that I'm not necessarily sold one way or the other on, although I lean definitely more towards the 100% property rights in every single situation. But I do understand that there is an issue with landlording and uh, things of that nature. But I also believe that the principle of homesteading, which I'll explain in a minute for those who aren't familiar with it, I believe that the process of homesteading can actually circumvent this problem of landlording and slumlords and things like that, because the basic premise of homesteading is if you make use of land or property within a certain area that you can control, then that's yours. Now, um, basically by this logic, the slaves would be the ones who would own the plantation because they're the ones who are working the land, things like that. At least that is the way that I interpret it. Now, I think that that's a perfect solution to the landlord issue, but I'm, I'm really actually interested in someday getting in a debate with a maybe a, a libertarian socialist or an anarcho-communist to see what their perspectives on my homesteading perspective is. Yeah, you know what I think I find the most intriguing, um, there's, a, there's a Facebook page or Facebook group called the Agorist Mutualist Alliance, and I see some good, uh, good information coming there from both sides because uh, the, the two, I guess, points where, where it's coming together outside of economics is that mutualism is about mutual aid, helping the community out, relying on the community, and agorism is essentially the same idea of building alternatives using, using counter-economics in just every area we see the government failing or the state um, doing a, a piss-poor job, we choose to create something new, something fresh that provides the community with, uh, with another uh, available choice in the market, and that they're both they're both just about helping each other. They're both about co community aid, and and those those ideas are really where I'm at and where I see the true solutions. Yeah, I, I agree completely, and that's why I'm I'm very interested in agorism and counter economics and just taking matters into your own hands. And I have seen that a lot of the uh, I guess mutualist crowd, you could call it, they take a lot more of uh, an interest in direct community action instead of just, uh, I guess, philosophical circle jerking, as uh, <laughs> some would call it. They actually get out there and do stuff in their community, and I can definitely appreciate and respect that. Yeah, that's uh, that's where it's got to be. It's got to get past the, uh, the point of just the circle jerks, and we've had that conversation a lot as well, and that includes circle jerking with your own kind, only staying in the libertarian circles or the, you know, dem sock cir circles or whatever it may be. If we're limit, we're really just limiting ourselves by staying into our little cliques. Um, now let's go a bit further into into agorism. Uh, what does agorism mean to you, and how do you employ the the practices, the principles of agorism in your daily life? Well, I would say that agorism is a strategy of counter-economics for uh, circumventing state control and providing uh, solutions for problems that the state is currently doing a really poor job handling, which is pretty much everything. So um, my, my approach to agorism is looking for solutions that aren't already established, that, that aren't a part of the state, and that people can do on their own. Um, so, I, you know, just 
do trading under the radar, setting up community gardens. Now, you are a lot more involved in this direct agorism than I am. You have gotten a lot more head start, and I'm just now starting to uh, sink my uh, feet into the actual community action part of things. But overall, um, just try to deal with the state as little as possible. And uh, if, if you need something done, look for a way to do it yourself or a way that people in your community uh, and yourself can work together. Sorry, that was a little jumpy. <laughs> no, no, I get what you're saying, man. I wanted to, uh, what I want to touch on, though, that I think that you recently told me about um, in, in a moment here, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it is how you're using elements of agorism, which includes the counter economy, the black market, and your, your, your shows and your promotions. So I want to get into that in a moment. But before we do, um, back in April, I wrote a short speech and gave it at, at Anarchy in NYC and New York City about what I was calling the four A's of, or the new four A's of agorism. If you've read um, the new Libertarian Manifesto or an agorist primer, you know Samuel Conkin III and you know his three A's of agorism were, of course, anarchy, agora, and action, which are, you know, the idea of self-rule, anarchy, which we already discussed, the agora, the marketplace of interaction where people exchange ideas and products and crafts, and action, like we just said, getting up and getting involved. And what I wanted to add to that, or was proposing to add to that, was a fourth A, which would be awareness. And in true Buddhist fashion, and just in, in a fashion of awareness, applying awareness to yourself. So when you, how can you truly know how to rule yourself if you don't know who you are and your doubts, your insecurities, your flaws and all those things, the good and the bad, truly knowing yourself, self-reflection, meditation. And again, applying that with your interactions with others in the, in the agora, in the marketplace, having compassionate interactions and compassionate exchanges, that gets us to mutual aid and other things like that. And then, of course, awareness just in your action, in all of your actions. So, and taking that, and I believe merging the ideas of Buddhism, of a spiritual awareness, with the ideas of radical agorism and um, and anarchy uh, coming together. And that led me to a phrase that we've discussed before, uh, which is that shamanism is the true anarchy. And I, I want to hear your thoughts on that, because I, 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 I'd love to hear what you have to say about the topic. Oh, I absolutely also like to call attention to one of my favorite things that you have ever said, and that is that uh, statism is the as spirituality or as religion is the spirituality. And that is basically that um, a, a lot of people get uh, it, it, it twisted in, in the whole black and white sense of, you know, you either have religion or atheism and there's nothing in between. And I think that shamanism really helps to bridge that gap because it allows people to take control of their own spiritual path and their own spiritual perspective. And while there is definitely right and wrong and true and false in this five sense reality there is a limitless possibilities beyond the five senses at least we can't uh, prove anything beyond the five senses at this point with our current technology so if if we have that situation going on where uh, basically there is, uh, sorry for stumbling here, but ba basically people can um, choose their own path in spirituality and there isn't necessarily a right or wrong, is what I'm trying to say, is that um, when it comes to our perspective on the afterlife or what lies beyond the five senses, we can all kind of have our own thing and we don't need to argue or kill each other over it. When it comes to right and wrong, in the world of five senses, I think that that is serious business that needs to be taken a lot more seriously. And, uh, of course, me and you both reflect on the non-aggression principle and the non-initiation of force. And I really think that that's really pretty much all you need to know when it comes to right now in the five senses. Um, 
but with shamanism, it puts the power of spirituality in people's own hands. And I would say that shamanism kind of requires some kind of altered state of consciousness. It doesn't have to be through drugs. Uh, meditation works for some people. Yoga works for some people. Drugs work for me. That's just my thing. I'm not really a meditation guy because um, my mind is, is too going crazy all the time. Not too great with yoga. Even though those are two goals for me, I tend to take the easy path in that regard. Yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to talk about conscious language, John, because you are limiting yourself in so many ways with the, with the way you're programming yourself right now. And you know better than that. So uh, what I want to touch on, though, is what you just well, said. touch on that now. Okay, well, what, what I want to get at is what you just said. Okay, you just stated that you're not a meditation guy and that, you know, this doesn't work for you because your mind is of this nature, which is completely true in your current reality. And that is the world that you're living in, this five-sense reality. But there's also, as you know, endless possibilities, and we are literally programming ourselves with our daily self-talk, with our conversations with each other, and of course we know through the media, external programming, but I believe the strongest sense of programming comes from within, you know, so I know that I have a very, I have some deep insecurity issues that I'm always working on, and so a lot of times I'm really just angry with myself or just mean to myself for no reason at all, and now that the more I've reflected on it, I'll catch myself and be like, wow, like, why am I calling myself an idiot in my head, like, that was just a simple mistake, and it's taken me a lot of years to sort of deprogram from that negative thinking. And so even beyond just negative thoughts that you have yourself, when you recognize that constantly telling yourself you're not capable of doing something or you haven't done it, conscious language, which is a, a term that was brought by this guy, I can't remember his, I think it's something Stevenson, um, I'll look it up on the break, but his, he wrote some books and had just different information on how important it was for us to to program our, ourselves through our words and through our language and how limiting we do uh, we are with ourselves. And he also mentions, and this is one that I think I'm personally, well, I know I'm personally guilty of. See, even right there, I just said I think even though I know that this is the case. Uh, he, he says how we meant, we use qualifiers, like sort of, kind of, I think, I kind of want to do this. I sort of did that. Like, we're not sure of ourselves. We don't bring ourselves fully into our words. We're haphazardly talking and so think about that the next time you're catching yourself and you, you're like, wait, no, I didn't sort of do that. I actually did do this, and I didn't kind of do it. I did do it. And so those, there's qualifiers that we all insert there, and then there's just things like where you can catch yourself mid-sentence and be, for example, like, um, I'm not good at meditation. Well, actually, in the past, I haven't been good at meditation because X, Y, and Z. But today, I'm learning to sit still. I'm learning to be with myself. Like, So you, you state what you used to be, and then you reclaim it and bring it into the present and even forward looking into the future of what your goal is. You see what I'm saying? And when we start to Absolutely. do this on a regular daily basis, I mean, you're, re you're literally manifesting the world that you want to see, which is an important part of, of uh, the shamanic path. Nah, absolutely, and and a lot of what you said definitely hit me because that's me all day with that negative thought, dude. And that is one massive obstacle that I need to overcome, not ju just to um, explore things like meditation more in depth, but just in general in my day to day life and those situations like you were saying, overcoming those insecurities and things like that. That's probably like one of the I, I would say I. I got a long way to live, so I have a lot of obstacles ahead of me, but that's one of the main obstacles that I see that I have been trying to find a way to overcome, and I think that suggestion of this conscious language is something that I should really look into, because it isn't something that I've really heard about a lot, and it sounds like it could be pretty helpful, to be honest with you. Oh, man, it's, I really believe it's, it's a life changer, because I was introduced to it by some people from here in Texas in Austin where there's regular groups that meet and it's like just a weekly class kind of just discussing uh, just just talking and then listening to yourself and realizing the ways that you limit yourself and learning to uh, as I said reprogram yourself I've said it before that we're gonna be programmed one way or another whether we do it passively and unconsciously and just let the media constantly fill our brain with whatever they want to think or we decide hey I'm gonna train myself to think this new way 
Um, you know, I'd rather be more in control of my own mind in the same way that I want to be in control of my physical body. I want to be in control of my, my mental state. And I agree with you, man. I think this is probably for a lot of people that fear is the mind killer. And fear and insecurities are paralyzing. And I think that it's something that we each struggle with daily, which is why, you know, the whole idea of the conscious resistance to me is taking the ideas of anarchy and the principles of liberty and all these things we discussed, but going deeper with it and recognizing that for me, I see that the, the root cause of these things is a deeper, uh, is something deeper. And if we don't go to those deeper levels and to communicate with each other and to really work on those things, we're going to end up just creating some new form of statism that is probably even more ego-based because what we'll get rid of the government and we'll have anarchy, we'll have self-rule, but then we're going to have a bunch of egomaniacs running around a bunch of sociopaths who don't know how to communicate their feelings and know how to work through uh, these states of, of mind. So I think that it's definitely important for us to to uh, to go deeper with this and to, whether you practice meditation, uh, getting back to shamanism now, whether you practice meditation or um, drumming, music is definitely a big part of shamanism. Uh, for the audience who may be un uninitiated, unaware, Shamanism is, uh, I've heard it, and this is probably one of my favorite phrases, I've heard it termed as the aboriginal roots of religion, which it's basically the, the natural traditional teachings that existed all around the world before people were able to control and define what it meant to be a shaman. It, some, it's different from being just a medicine man or a witch. It's somebody that has the ability or chooses to have the ability to access altered states of minds, and yes, sometimes that's through plant concoctions such as ayahuasca, which can, contains DMT, or that can also be through, uh, as I said, drumming, deep drumming states of mind, which is what I prefer to do, and also through, uh, it's been shown as well that you can reproduce the same state of mind through meditation by counting the breath, because essentially what it is, it's just repetition. It's the repetition of the drum over and over that lulls your brain into that, that uh, state of mind, those brain waves there that allow you to go to on deep journeys and that these journeys can be facilitated by another person sort of directing you or they can be physical journeys uh, you know a long journey in the physical world maybe out camping for a few days it's really something that can't be defined by anyone else outside of you and this taps into all kinds of other forms of uh, I guess perceiving and altering reality because one true aspect of what a shamanic experience is about is definitely the altered states of consciousness, the trance states of consciousness. And this is where, um, I mean, this is just flowing beautifully from anarchy to music. This is where another area where I think that we have a good amount in common is the understanding that shamanic states of consciousness can be introduced through, um, through external devices such as drugs or, or plants or chemicals, things like that. It can also be introduced through meditation. It can be introduced by the banging, the repetition of a beautiful, beautiful drum. And that beautiful, beautiful drum represents another form of bass. You know, banging bass, repeating bump and bass. And you know all about that and how that can contribute to altered states of mind and to creating this, really this new age of shamanism, which is infused with electronic music. You know, there's, there are electronic shamans out there now who are taking people to deep altered states of consciousness and be a allowing them to access states of their own mind that they weren't aware of through uh, through music, you know. And you do a lot of this. You help facilitate a lot of this with Good Vibes Promotion. So I want you to uh, both respond to what you think about shamanism and music, and uh, t tell us a little bit about Good Vibes Promotions. Oh, I completely agree, and that that's kind of the way that I have always seen it is not just music, but art in general. Any type of art is. Uh, the imagination coming to life, essentially. And music is definitely a big part of that, especially because of the vibratory uh, You and I both know that everything is basically a vibration. And then when you have music and bass and drumming and things like that, that's um, intensifying vibrations around you to a certain level or certain degree. And I believe that our ancient ancestors, they would you know, go out into the woods and they would find some, you know, plants to mix together that would take them to this state and that they would sit around the campfire and drum and dance and sing. And now, you know, our world's different. We, we live in the jungle. We, we go to these warehouses or we go to these clubs and we, we put on this loud, 
you know, vibratory music that, that kind of takes us <laughs> to that same state. And now maybe we have different chemical situations. Some people don't even need the chemicals, as I was saying earlier. And more power to them. I'm not saying that that's, um, you know, necessary. Um, but I, I think that this is just advancement of what we have always been doing. And I really do feel that that's why it's out there. Because as you and I both know, they do not want us to have that spiritual connection. Because then, like you're ta- you were talking about earlier, we can find these ways past this, this ego-based lifestyle, these insecurities, and you know, all of this self-doubt that uh, you know, we all still fall into. Uh, that helps us overcome them. Uh, in, in regards okay. to my company, Good Vibes Promotions, I kind of make it a point to be a lot more explicit about that. A lot of uh, people in my line of work, they're very afraid to talk about it. And no disrespect to them, if they, they want to run their business the way they want to run it, that's completely cool. But they're afraid to talk about the psychedelic element of what they do uh, because they don't want to make it look like they're condoning anything or they're going to bring more police trouble upon them uh, for their events. And uh, I first and foremost want to keep the people safe that come out, but I also don't want to pull any punches about what I believe in and what I think I'm trying to provide for people and the kind of environment that I'm trying to provide for people. And what I'm is that? I about that. Did you want to say something there? What type of environment is that that you're trying to provide? Um, for lack of a better word, a, a psychedelic environment. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, I, many of your audience may not be too familiar with the term "flur," but um, it's basically the raver's adaptation of the non-aggression principle, or at least that's the way that I look at it. Uh, it stands for peace, love, unity, and respect. And that is something that I talk about a lot. Some people in the mainstream rape culture think that that's cheesy or out of date. But that's something that I bring to the forefront a lot. And I am not, a, um, I don't shy away from the psychedelic element of what I do. I embrace it and I advertise it to the fullest extent. And I don't think that there's a problem with that. Um, you know, it, it might put me under a little bit of a microscope, but I think that I hold down my events pretty well and keep everybody safe. And, you know, knock on wood, there has never been any kind of major police issue at one of my events. The worst thing that did happen is one, events, uh, one of the events that I helped out with in North Carolina a couple of years ago did get raided, like SWAT team, night vision goggles, everything like that. Uh, that wasn't my event, that was an event I co-hosted, but I still, I definitely took responsibility for that, you know what I mean? And that happens at any kind of event, regardless um, of whether it's a rave or a concert or anything like that, these things do happen. But what makes my company a lot more, or I would say what makes me is the fact that I don't shy away from the psychedelic nature of what we do and I, I don't try to conform to the mainstream. Uh, I don't try to be legitimate uh, in in the mainstream sense. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you do out there with uh, with with psychedelic culture, like you said, for lack of a better better word, because um, that's something that I don't believe we should have to be shy about either. There, you know, especially in the day and age that we are in now, where the revival of uh, psychedelics uh, for therapeutic use is coming back where you know studies are starting to begin again and we know the power of psilocybin mushrooms we're learning once again the power of MDMA for therapy uh, they talked about MDMA therapy for PTSD for veterans and all different types of uses and as we've already discussed the shamanic uses of these things and of course there's always going to be abuse when it comes to substances but that's not that's again up to the individual to uh, ex- to decide for themselves not for um, for you to dictate, but I think it's important for us to create these spaces, these sacred, safe spaces where people can choose to come be in an environment and go down that shamanic path, uh, whether they recognize it that way or not. 
and come to an experience, as you said, that is essentially just the new new uh, version of being around the fire and uh, you know beating on drums. You're being you know people still do that today, but now we have another ad adaptation of that, and that's coming to warehouses, coming to big raves, and having lights and and music and bass and having these deep experiences. And um, I think it's a very important work that you do to provide a safe space for that for people. Yeah, no, I, I definitely appreciate that. And on the um, bringing the counter economics back in, I, I think I am proud to say at this point, and if there's anybody out there that wants to correct me, I do believe that I'm probably the only rave promoter, at least in the country, maybe in the planet, that does accept Bitcoin for pre-sale tickets and at the door. That, that's what I was hinting at earlier, man, a way that you use agorism in music, and I think that is amazing, dude. Tell me about that, dude. I want to be able to do that down here in Houston for our shows. How did you? How do you? How do you make that happen? Well, actually, I was kind of inspired by what I saw at Pork Fest this year. Um, one of the coolest things I, I noticed there was the, the marketplace situation, and for those that don't know, uh, Pork Fest is the Porcupine Freedom Festival that the Free State Project in New Hampshire hosts every year. I had the pleasure to speak at that event about uh, art and its influence on activism. And while I was there, I noticed that it was kind of rare for people to trade with dollars. People were trading with silver and Bitcoin. And I was observing about how the whole Bitcoin situation worked because at the time, although I was a passive observer in Bitcoin, I hadn't really participated that much. And I still haven't because I'm kind of a broke dude. I don't have any expendable income to be dumping into Bitcoin. So I have about three bucks in Bitcoin right now. But um, it's extremely easy. If you have a Bitcoin uh, wallet address, all you need uh, to do is get the QR code for that. And you print out the QR code. You put it at the ticket booth or the door or wherever. Um, you're selling your product if, if you're working a concession stand or something like that. You tape a piece of paper with the printed out QR code right there. And then all that somebody has to do is come up with their phone, scan that QR code, and then they can send Bitcoin directly to your address right there at the time. That is so cool, man. That is so cool. I'm definitely gonna gonna get that set up out here so we can do that for our shows because <clears throat> I think it's important for us as we've discussed to to recognize that agorism is not a philosophy to to remain in the books it is uh, or to remain online is something that you have to put into practice and much like the shamanic practices and meditation and some of these deeper reflection all those things that we've covered tonight they involve taking action and that's some it's a common uh, theme that I see. Uh, one thing I wanted to for us to touch on, man, and just I guess for us to touch up ourselves on is uh, our book project. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that, man, and maybe we can set some goals for ourselves on how we can move that forward in the coming year. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll let you go ahead and introduce. Like first, like I said earlier, you got me the job. My first writing job, really getting paid, as far uh, for IntelliHub, and um, you know we started talking about. These, these similar ideas that we have and currents that we've seen between spiritual beliefs and anarchy and how they coincide. You know, how, how do you feel about that topic? Um, I, it's one of the most important topics for me personally as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying that that means it's one of the most important topics in the world, but I feel that that is the best place that I can contribute. Um, because I think that it's an angle that isn't approached very often. And, um, you know, that, that's why I was very uh, impressed with the work that you've been doing. And I think that it, it, you, your, your talk regarding this at Anarchy and the NYC got an extremely good response. And I was actually kind of surprised with that. And I remember so were you, because both of us were really thinking that if it was going to be a very atheist uh, crowd, but it seems like we're not the only ones out there who see this spiritual path and uh, the liberty path coinciding. Um, so in, in regards to the book, um, since 
we're some of the few people out there doing this work that kind of run the same lines. I think it's definitely important for us to put our ideas together. Over the fall, you and I both have been uh, kind of busy in our own worlds here, but I think that now, like, as you're getting set up with your new radio show and, and you kind of got the, uh, you know, the background and the, the backbone for that all set, that, and now I have the backbone for my show set that we can actually start to get down to that. And I think that um, another important thing that we should put in the book is um, the element of abuse and addiction and things like that because, you know, there is lightness and darkness in this world. There is, you know, there is positive and negative and there are um, personal choices that people, uh, you know, need to be conscious of. And I think that we definitely need to open up every single element. Yeah, definitely. And for those who haven't heard one of uh, either one of us talk about this, the book, we're likely going to call it something along the lines of The Conscious Resistance, Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality, uh, covering those two topics and our interest in anarchy, agorism, counter-economics, and how having a compassionate spiritual understanding, and that you know touches on Buddhism and shamanism. And also, I, I think I told you, John, somebody had represented uh, a rep uh, requested that we look into Epicurean philosophy as a, it coincides with um, anarchy as well. And so there's there's a lot of, the more I'm finding is, as you said, the more we speak out about these things, because I, I will admit that going into Anarchy NYC, I was like, okay, I'm here with like Stefan Molyneux and Adam and some of these other people who openly profess and make fun of anybody type of spiritual belief and uh, Cantwell and those others who consider themselves to be strong and proud anarchist atheists and uh, giving a speech that's basically saying, hey, like, go deeper, meditate, or look into yourself, and things like that, and it was well received, and immediately after that, I started to get, um, you know, messages from people in emails asking for more information about meditation, or asking for more information about shamanism, or how they, you know, just looking for tips and ideas, which, again, is important for us to have that sense of community to help teach each other, and to help each other learn, because... I by no means profess to be any type of authority on the topics of Buddhism, meditation, Zen, or shamanism, but they are interests of mine and have been and have taught me some great things the past few years, so I'm going to continue down that path, and I'm excited to write about it with you, man. I think that some of the essays that I know I've mentioned to you before are things like the importance of your inner child and your search for freedom. I've written about um, animal consciousness and uh, just looking into that on your search for freedom. We've also... Um, want to work up something else I did before called uh, um, Monuments of, uh, of Freedom, discussing how we have these uh, monu monuments of tyranny basically surrounding us uh, currently and working to, uh, to change that. So there's a lot of interesting topics. Again, like you said, the dark and the light side, so to speak, of shamanism. Uh, we talked about how, well, what happens when uh, when people are, what happens with these older ancient teachings, you know, how they used to sacrifice people and do all these different things to the sun, but again, when you take into consideration the non-aggression principle, that whole argument falls apart. So I think there's a lot of interesting pieces for us to pick apart there. Oh, also, yeah, definitely. And you, you mentioned um, about Adam and uh, his atheism. Hasn't he changed his tune recently a little bit, maybe? Uh, at least in regards to being a little, little bit more open-minded about meditation and maybe things that lie beyond the five senses? Well, Adam definitely seems to have, you know, we interviewed him as soon as he got out and we played that interview here on the first episode of the show. Uh, and that interview can be found on, on my YouTube channel, on the Houston Freethinkers YouTube channel. And Adam did mention, um, as it was seemed to be apparent to me the more I was listening to his podcast from jail, that he was obviously spending the time reflecting, and that's what happened to me when I got locked up, and, uh, you know, you did your own reflection and your experience, and that that's what sometimes happens with people who go in already with a strong mind, that they go inward and get even stronger and become even more self-aware, and Adam seemed to do that. He definitely said he spent some time meditating, and uh, I, I, I'm hoping that he continues the practice, uh, again, knowing that meditation can be Anything from riding your bike to sitting down with your eyes closed for five minutes doesn't necessarily always have to be sitting in lotus position, um, you know, chanting or s s citing a mantra. 
meditation can take uh, play, take many forms, and I think uh, that's important to remember, and hopefully the audience understands that. Yeah, and that, that's a, a good reminder to me also for that conversation we had earlier. That is definitely something that I'm going to work on. But, and I also remembered another one of the essays that we were going to discuss, and that was the idea of the balance between the fact that we are all one, yet we are all individuals. Oh, yeah, how everybody, uh, you know, not everybody, but there is a, definitely a contingent that is weary or worried about the phrase, um, we are all one, how that, oh, that's part of that new age. You know, there's, there's a contingent that basically understands the push towards world government that the state is doing, but they're coming from the perspective that thinking anything that they would term under the catch-all new age is, uh, you know, part of the problem or is, uh, you know, a new world order ploy or something along those lines. So they are pretty, re they're instantly reactive and also those who just have an anti-status, anti-collectivist mindset who are reactive to statements like, oh, we're all one. And I had a debate with Chris Cantwell about this a while back about how, you know, he, him and others believe like, well, there, how can that be? We're not all one. I see you over there. I see you here. And I, I think that we're both of the understanding that there are multiple levels to our understanding of reality, on, and on many of them, molecular, uh, energetic, and just as a community that we do seem to be um, of one being, but also independent. Yeah, absolutely, and I don't think that there really uh, is a distinction there. I think that we can be individuals, yet still be all, all one. Um, and I, I think that that is something that really has not been hashed out before, and I'm really kind of excited to work that out and see what we come up with. Yeah, I'm excited about that as well, man. And we, you know, we've got a lot to cover in that book, so hopefully, we'll, like you said, we'll be able to make some. We will be able to make some more time. We will choose to make more time for ourselves in the coming future, so we can get this work done and get it out there uh, to those who need to hear it and see it themselves. Anything else you want to you want to say before we let you go for the night, man? It's been a good conversation. I've enjoyed this very much. Well, I, I just noticed in that last sentence that uh, conscious use of the conscious language, and uh, I think that that's awesome, and that's something that I'm really going to look more into. And I uh, appreciate that uh, candid piece of advice earlier here because it was probably much needed. For, for sure, brother. Always looking out for for each of us, man, and. Uh, one one thing I do want to say to end this conversation, what you just touched on a moment ago in our our new essay that is going to touch on how we are all one and how that is not a bad thing, but we're because we're also powerfully independent, is the idea of the jeweled net of Indra, which comes from it's a Buddhist story that discusses how we are each basically a piece of this this blanket, this infinite, you could you could think of it as our consciousness. It's an, a blanket that extends in all directions, and the blanket is made up of jewels, of shining diamonds. And we are each one of those single shining diamonds, but we're also strewn together and connected in every direction to another diamond. So we're each like a reflection of each other, but also in our own experience, in our own world, we are amazing, we are beautiful, and we are powerful, but we're still a part of this greater, um, this greater peace that extends in all directions. So that's that's something that when I first read that and came across it, it really put it in you know in physical terms where I could look and see like wow like that is a, really a true reflection of what we are. We are just reflecting each other, which is why I believe if we can heal these deeper wounds, whatever your method is, whether your method is praying, whether your method is ingesting um, plants or chemicals or drums or dancing, however you achieve this deeper state of mind that allows you reflection and allows you healing, that is what's important for us to truly move forward and to be consciously resisting, to, to be awake in a manner that we're pursuing new information, we're, we're educating ourselves, but we're also healing and we're healing each other. That's when it's really going to happen, you know, because as far as I'm concerned, and I think you would agree with this, John, that w the, the matrix is a reflection of ourself and as long as we are hurt and we are insecure and we are full of all these things, these things will be reflected in the world that we see in the, in the five sense reality. And so we have to educate ourselves about it. We have to heal from it. We have to help others heal. And I believe that we will start to see that reflected in the world around us. So I appreciate your help, man.
with everything. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with that statement and that uh, story about the jewels and the blanket. I love that. I'm going to have to look into that. And uh, I really appreciate you having me on, and I'm looking forward to next time. Absolutely, brother. I appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon. Let everybody know where they can find your work real quick. Um, yeah, I'm still definitely writing for IntelliHub. They're just going through some server changes right now, and I've been kind of preoccupied with uh, good vibes, but I'm really active on my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash jgvibes, or the overflow page at facebook.com slash goodvibespro. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I will talk to you soon, brother. All right, have a great night. Thank you. That was John Good Vibes of Alchemy for the Modern Renaissance. Which one? That was John Good Vibes of Alchemy of the Modern Renaissance, and of course he said he writes for the IntelliHub. He is a good friend of mine, Good Vibes Promotion. Check him out. Uh, stay tuned. We are about to go to some more music, and when we get back, I'm going to show you a clip of some Man on the Street interviews I did, and then we're going to close out. i got a couple of announcements to make. And then we're out of here for the night. I appreciate you guys staying tuned. That was a, I enjoyed that conversation thoroughly. If you guys have questions, if you want to call into the show, we can do calls tonight. If you're interested in that, um, I'll spit the number out before we go to some music. 713-701-5064. Or if you want to call via Skype, our, our Skype name is The Voice of the Resistance. Send us a friend request and we'll see if we can get you online. If you want to talk about anything we covered tonight or whatever you want, We'll do that. Uh, and again, I appreciate those of you who've shared the link, those of you who have visited theconsciousresistance.com and who are watching via the website. Thank you very much for giving us that traffic. And please visit our partners, Uncorporate Media. Visit Freedom Phalanx Radio Network, Truth Broadcasting Network. Thank you to the guys at Rundown Live and everybody who has really helped make this production possible. We're, you know, we're working our way through the kinks, and it's only going to get better from here. So I really, really appreciate the support. If you want to help even further, check out theconsciousresistance.com slash invest. You can donate Bitcoin, Federal Reserve notes. We've got multiple options, and you can get access to videos that we do not release to the public, maybe raw footage or just unseen interviews, like some of the stuff I discussed earlier today at the airport with the TSA, and also the option of me sending you a seasonal seed sample of heirloom non-GMO seeds so you guys can get your own garden started because I really want to get you to a place of action. So I appreciate those who tuned in to hear John Good Vibes. Please stay tuned. We've got about 10 to 15 more minutes left, and I would love for you to check out the rest of the show. We will be back in just a moment with uh, with some more videos. Right now we're going to go to Days and Days. Days and Days. This is a video of Days and Days, which is a Houston, for lack of a better term, folk punk, riot folk band um, that is really good friends of mine and of the Houston Freethinkers. They play a lot of our shows, and they did a house show here at our house last week. There was some stick and poke tattoos. There was some screen printing going on, and a bunch of crazy drunk punk kids dancing around our backyard. And my buddy Jeff got some video of that and a short interview with Brian of Days and Days. So check this out. Enjoy. We'll be right back. This is the Conscious Resistance Live. Thank you. 